everybody has preferences. Everybody, almost everybody has a difficult time finding their person, unless you're that lucky one that it's like the first or second person that you meet. And other than that, it's just a really difficult process. To me, it's the hardest thing that you can do. Get a job, you can get a job, move to a new city, no problem. Find an apartment, a house, whatever. All of those things you could really do. Find a life partner and choose them and have them choose you back and live a life together. That to me is the hardest thing in the world. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Starstruck with Sarah Pachter, brought to you by Aish. Here on this podcast, I interview celebrities, digital influencers, and philanthropists, as well as those with stories of unusual resilience. I try to draw out the deeper meaning behind their everyday choices and share that with you in a relatable way. For more episodes and other content, subscribe to Aish.com's podcast channel. And now, on today's episode, we have a wonderful, wonderful woman named Eliza Ben Shalom. She is a professional dating coach, speaker, and author of the new book, Virtual Dating, and the book, Get Real, Get Married. She is the featured matchmaker on the new Netflix series called Jewish Matchmaking, and she founded the company Marriage Minded Mentor, which connects singles from around the world with skilled dating coaches and matchmakers. She has helped countless of people get married, and she herself is married with five children. Wow, Eliza is a real powerhouse. We're thrilled to have her join us on the show today. Eliza, welcome. Hi, I'm so happy to be here with you. Oh, we are so happy to have you. It's such an honor. I've read your articles. I've heard so much about you. It's such an honor for me to speak to you because I love, love, love your work. So I kind of want to start with Netflix. I just want to get right into it. Tell us about the show. How'd you get into it? Uh, talk to me. So the funny thing is that a matchmaker made the match <laughs> between oh, me cute. and casting. Yeah, it's adorable. And uh, they they were interviewing a bunch of different people. And she's like, oh, Lisa, I don't want to be on this show, but you're good. We've been doing Zoom dating events. We've been doing matchmaker training events. And you're great on camera. You should do it. I gave them your phone number. <laughs> Hope that's OK. Wow. And that's how the match was made. That's so cool. I love that. And uh, in general, how did you get started? in this career, kind of what motivated you to begin? I always saw my parents happily and healthfully married, grandparents were married, and I was really inspired by having, you know, a beautiful family unit. And I, I just, all over, I saw people, um, I saw relationships, and I, I, like, I was one of those people watchers who would kind of just... <laughs> be highly amused by sitting down and watching people as they're coming and going. And I, I just started to, I don't know, it was kind of like a go between for my friends and anybody in my network. And I would kind of casually set people up, you know, Oh, what do you think about this one? I mean, I think he might like you. Oh, I think she might like you. <laughs> and I just started to naturally do that. And then after I got married myself and I had two kids, I was home, there was lots of baby talk. And I was like, okay, you know what? I need adult interaction. <laughs> I got to do something. What am I going to do? And I found uh, online Saw You at Sinai, which is a matchmaker platform to set singles up. And that's how I got started. And so I started doing these, you know, paper matches and putting people together. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to talk to people. And I'd get on the phone with them and then I'd coach them. And it just was this very organic process that, uh, that started to happen. That's great. And as a dating coach, you know, you're probably helping so many people, but I'm, I'm curious, did you ever struggle when you were dating or was that an easy process for you? I think everybody struggles when they're dating. There's like one in a million that's like, oh, the very first person I dated, I married. I think for most people, we have a story of struggle where you meet people and you're like, okay, how's this supposed to work? Is that, is that possible? Could that really be the one? I mean, maybe, what if? So I personally grew up, you know, conservative, Jew-ish. I became observant in my mid-20s. And my dating process was a series of, I mean, everybody's is a series of failures, which is you try it, it doesn't work, you move on. You try it, it doesn't work, it moves on. You move on until you actually meet that person. So right. yes, I absolutely struggled. 
So that's great that you're taking your struggle and you're helping other people on their on their pathway. Okay, so between you and me, let's let's be honest here. I need the real you for a second. From your perspective, do you think that dating is harder for men or for women today? And why? Yeah, I'm going to think about that for a minute. Good question. I mean, the short answer, I think that dating is harder for people. If you're a person that wants to find another person, I think that dating is a difficult process. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're going to hear from other people is that there's you know, a crisis. There's more women to men. You'll hear this in the Jewish world. You'll hear this in the non-Jewish world. It doesn't matter all over. It seems to be like the theme of the world that there's more single women than single men. Um, but I'm kind of of the opinion that God doesn't do fuzzy math and that there's something that we're just not seeing clearly here. And I think that there's been times in the world where it felt the opposite way, where there were more available um, women and, you know, fewer men. And so like things feel out of balance. I think that it's a matter of perspective. And from my understanding of the way that the world works, you know, it's in the blueprint of creation that your person is here, right? We come into the world, our soulmate comes into the world. And then we play this little game of like, where's Waldo? Where's my person? And we go into the world and we search for them and we try to find them. So is it hot? I can't really say that it's harder for one or the other. Everybody has preferences. Everybody, almost everybody, has a difficult time finding their person, unless you're that lucky one that it's like the first or second person that you meet. And other than that, it's just a really difficult process. To me, it's the hardest thing that you can do. Get a job, you can get a job. Move to a new city, no problem. Find an apartment, a house, whatever. All of those things you could really do. Find a life partner and choose them and have them choose you back and live a life together. That, to me, is the hardest thing in the world. Yeah, I guess it's probably a bad time to tell you that my husband was the second guy I dated. Probably the bad, the worst time to tell you that. You're, you're, one of the, you're one of the lucky ones that it worked out for. It's a, there's a very small percentage of you in the world. Like, I don't right. know, 1%? <laughs> Maybe. But, but listen, but, you know, <laughs> but I'm also a dating coach and I help people as well. And I, I think that when it comes to, as you mentioned, your profession or, or what you're doing, those are things you can check off of a list. You know, you have control over it. You can done, done, done. But when it comes to relationship, you can't control, you can't control the outcome. And so I think that's where, you know, the difference lies. But as you mentioned, obviously there are both men and women, you know, all people are mostly struggling in dating. What motivation do you give to people who are struggling in the dating scene? For me, I give them the confidence that their person is here, they're living, they're breathing, they're in existence in this world, and we just have to find them. And once we have clarity about who somebody is and clarity about what they're looking for, it makes the finding them process a little bit easier. So um, I love, first of all, I'm very excited that you're a dating coach. Yay. <laughs> and we do have something in common. Once I became observant, my husband was the second person that I dated. So my, oh. my previous dating efforts didn't work. But in, uh, in the observant world, once it happened, he was the second person I dated. So I think I that should clarify that the same was for me as well. So we're really more in common than, than we twins. realized. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. So this is kind of an aggressive question, but I'm going to do it anyways. Okay. What is the worst thing that someone can do when they are dating? Ooh, I don't like it when people put themselves down, when they constantly, it, it's like, instead of putting your best foot forward, you always stick your foot in your mouth and you're always putting yourself down. Somebody's like, oh, you look lovely. I'm like, oh, it's not my best thing. It's really an old thing. Or, you know, like, wow, that story was, you know, like so cool, so exciting. But like, yeah, I mean, like not as good as compared to my other friend who does such and so where where I don't even have enough self-esteem to just have confidence and be happy and enjoy the moment with another dater. That to me is really the worst thing that somebody can do. Because if, if I don't see the greatness in me and if I don't enjoy me, you're probably not going to enjoy me either. And the whole thing's going to probably fail. There you go. Exactly. So, you know, on, on the note of some bad things people can do when they're dating, why do you think ghosting is so bad? What does it do to the person psychologically who is ghosting? And what does it do to the person who is being ghosted? The person who's ghosting is just checking out. They're not emotionally available. They're not emotionally present and they're not being 
articulate and clear and communicative. So they're having unhealthy ways of interacting with other people in the world and they're developing bad habits, which will follow them into quote, the right relationship and probably ruin that relation, that relationship in terms of the one who's being ghosted, it leaves them on pause, right? Like, Oh, I, I have a little hope. Oh, maybe this is going to work out. Oh, I mean, there's something brewing here. And then all of a sudden somebody disappears and you're like, what, 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 what? where did they go? Yeah. Wait, what? So it leaves me on pause and I'm like, should I pause my dating life and wait for you to respond? Because maybe there's a normal, healthy amount of time. Maybe you're busy. Maybe somebody, God forbid, passed away in your family and there's an emergency. All of a sudden my head is spinning to think of excuses why you might not be responsive, but it holds up my dating and it prevents me from moving on. And then when I figure out finally, okay, wait, you're not coming back. Now I'm moving on. But now I'm left with a whole series of questions. Mostly, was it you or was it me? Or was it us? Or what was the problem? Or it just, it leaves more questions than answers. And I think so many people have told me, Aliza, I would so much rather be turned down. I'd rather get a no. I'd rather have clarity. You tell me I'm ugly. You moved on. Great. I'd rather that than ghosting. It's so much better to wrap up having an understanding than to be left in the dark. Yeah, it kind of blocks the closure. And when you don't get that closure, it can leave you feeling really, really vulnerable. So, you know, to dovetail off of vulnerability, we have been talking about a bunch of negative stuff regarding dating. Let's shift to something a little more positive and the positive side of vulnerability. I know you wrote the book, Get Real, Get Married. So I'm sure you talk a lot about vulnerability there. Um, how do you define vulnerability and why is it so important when you are dating? Vulnerability to me is when somebody can be authentic and be real and be in the moment and we're not putting either side down. We're just present. We're with somebody and we're sharing. We're having that moment. It's almost like you hear my voice a little bit quieter. It's almost like I'm telling you a secret. Like I want to share something with you. That's how a vulnerable moment usually feels. It doesn't come across that way all the time. It might come across by me sharing something that I don't normally share or telling you a little bit of an insight or something that I think, or maybe one of my hopes or my dreams that maybe I don't really share very often, but it's very personal to me. And I feel like you're really getting an inside look at me. And it's a, it's a very delicate moment because if somebody else comes in while I'm sharing a hope or a dream and they come to squash it, you can, you can count on the, the chemistry and, and the interaction just being squashed and, and not taking us to the next level. But if somebody hears a vulnerable moment or experiencing, experiences something in person and there's that connection, boom, we could go 10 levels high. We can jump so far just from one single moment. So yeah. vulnerability to me is captured just... It, it's almost like it's it's a moment and you have very little time to get it right. But when you get it right, it is golden. Yeah, I view it as almost like a tightrope where if you share too much too soon, you get problems too little too late. It's also not good. Would you say it's important to kind of vulnerability is slowly but surely stripping away the layers with the right person at the right time? Exactly. Okay. It's all about timing and it's the build up of it as well. And sometimes we take a little bit of a leap. It's not always just a slow, gradual increase. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we, we give a little, we kind of pull back a little, then we jump two steps ahead and then one step back. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit of a, I think of it more of a dance than just slowly building. There does have to be a give and a take. The vulnerability has yeah. to come from your side. Then it has to come from my side. And when we move together and we give and we take, it builds progressively over time. Yeah. I, I had a student actually who both of her parents were alcoholics and she was really scared to share that with the guy. Um, but at the right time she did. And she told me afterwards, she felt like that was the point where their connection really, really, really deepened. So I yeah. see exactly what you're saying. Um, but continuing on with vulnerability, and I want to take the flip side of it for a second, because I know for a lot of people, dating and of course marriage is really scary and part of that reason is that we don't really know who the person is that we are with we think we know who they are we have an image of the person sometimes it's infatuation unfortunately or fortunately with the person but how can people really uncover the true 
person that they are dating. You know, I think everybody wears a thick mask, a facade, even you and I right now, we have a mask on, you know, how can we peel away the layers to see the person for who they really are? The only thing for this is time. You have to see them over a period of time and you won't see it in the first moment or the first meeting or the first month. You'll see it in the second month a little bit more and things will grow over time. But when we're talking about a timeline, you have to have a consciousness of different people from different backgrounds. And for some people, a dating timeline is very short and for other people, it's very long. So just to give it a, a comparison, what one couple might do in one week in terms of connection and vulnerability and building, another couple might get to that same spot and it might take them a month. So we time is the, the factor that we need to build and to grow our relationships. And the speed depends on the couple, their background, and how they are culturally and typically dating in their life. Mm -hmm. So almost like you would say quality versus quantity, maybe. In exactly. Terms of that. Okay. Exactly. Okay, great. So we mentioned infatuation for a second. Let's talk about that. What do you think? And I know I'm sure you've talked about this a million times on a million different podcasts, but I'd like to hear your perspective. What is the difference between infatuation and love? And we know that infatuation can be dangerous, but is there any redeeming factors of infatuation? Can it help us in any way? Definitely there is a redeeming factor in infatuation, which is it gets us over that hurdle. Like I'm willing to do it. I'm in. I like you. Ooh, I'm feeling something. There's like so much excitement that, that's there and it takes away those inhibitions. It's almost like having a little bit of a drink. It takes the edge off. And now I can do what I think I really want to do. I feel a little bit like superwoman. Da -da. I can do it and I can take that leap with you. The danger in infatuation is that it doesn't last. And so, oh, I like you. You like me. Oh, I feel like I love you. You love me. Oh, there's so much here. It's so exciting. There's something that's really happening. And it's overwhelming. The, the, the feeling of infatuation usually is a kind of a mind, body, soul experience that is all encompassing where we are so excited. We've just, we feel it. We know it. We feel it. But the problem is infatuation doesn't last. Love right is built through giving. The root of the word love in Hebrew, ahava, have, to give. And so the only way to truly develop love and long lasting love is to give over a period of time, over a lifetime. And the longer we do that in the dating process, the more that we develop a, a true love for somebody versus a feeling of love, which is really masking and it's infatuation. Yeah, that's beautiful. And also we see that even in the parent-child dynamic, the parent always loves the child more than the child loves the parent because the parent is constantly giving, even if it's 3 a.m. and uh, they need a bottle or whatever. So um, that's very true, what you mentioned about ahav, ahava and the root of it being to give. So do you think, you know, I, I kind of want to understand, do you think that most people don't really let themselves get to the love part? Like, for example, they're dating, they're infatuated, when the, and when infatuation falls, drops off, before the love can begin, they're like, oh, I'm not into him anymore. Or, oh, I'm not into her anymore. Yes. I mean, the short answer is yes, mm -hmm. that dating and love and relationships takes time and we don't really have patience for that. We're just right. like, I got to feel it. I got to feel it. Oh, not feeling it. I'm out. Aliza, I know. I know because when I don't feel it, I don't feel it. And I'm not going to continue with this because I know it's not going to lead anywhere. But many of the couples that I've worked with, when I encourage them to date a little bit longer, hang in there, see how it goes, many of them shift and go, well, I guess, I mean, I wasn't feeling it, but that's so unusual. Now we've been going out for six weeks and I mean, he or she has kind of grown on me and I, right. I just, I don't know, I, I am feeling something in a way that I wasn't expecting it to feel. So it's more like a feeling that comes on slowly over time as opposed to maybe you can call it love bombing or when somebody just drops it on you and you're like, wow, I'm just, I'm so into it. I'm feeling it just in an instant. It's so much more real when it comes on over time. Yes. So I just want to say one more question on infatuation, which is I think that sometimes when we're infatuated with someone, I have seen that 
unfortunately, when men or women are very charismatic, they, they get the person to be infatuated or you feel infatuated with them, you get into a relationship and sometimes that leads to really dangerous things within the marriage. So what do you tell someone who has completely been fooled by the person that they're dating? I try to slow those relationships down and I mm -hmm. ask them mm -hmm. to take a deep dive and look into what are the patterns, what has been happening here, and to step out of the emotional side of it to kind of take mm -hmm. a bird's eye view and look at the actual behaviors, look at the pattern of behaviors and things that are happening and have a conversation about them. And and my again, my whole goal is to slow the brain down, slow the heart down. You know, when we calm our breathing down, we can mm -hmm. think a little bit more rationally. So we actually mm -hmm. want to physically do that. Calm the breathing down, relax, hyper-focus on this relationship and take a real evaluation. Say, oh, the good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Wait, what else is going on here? Let me not be afraid to dig deep because when people are afraid to dig deep, it's because they know that there's actually really a problem. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, no, I don't, I don't want to look at that. I just, it's, it's good. It's good for now. I just want to enjoy the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So enjoy the infatuation ride. But if you take a moment and you dig deep and you're authentic and you're real and you evaluate your relationship, then you can say, well, I like this and I don't like that. And you can go back and forth. And at the end of the day, you can still pick them but you mm -hmm. pick them because of the good and you also pick them because you accept the other, all that other stuff that when you're infatuated, you don't even want to look at. Right. And I think that's good advice, whether or not there's red flags. So that's great. Uh, I want to ask you, give us your top three tips for dating. Ooh, just anyone, anywhere. Top three tips. Okay. Yes, let's go. Let's Number do it. one, if you want to find your person, never stop looking. Okay. Never, not never stop looking, never give up hope. Don't just say, well, whatever, I guess love wasn't meant for me. Okay, I can't do it. Number one would definitely be stick with it and keep dating. You need a vacation, go on vacation. Here's my prescription. Aliza, the love doctor says, go on vacation, come back, date again, renew, right, renew your energy. That would be my number one thing. Number two would be network, network, network. As a matchmaker, you, and as your own matchmaker, you have to constantly build your network. If you don't want to do it, definitely hire a matchmaker. But other than that, you can be your own matchmaker. We have a whole course on teaching people how to be your own matchmaker. And you can actually do that. And you need to network. Just like if you wanted a job, you would talk to people from all over. You'd make connections on LinkedIn or wherever. In dating, Every single platform, every single contact of yours is a potential person who either knows another person who knows your person or somewhere down the line is connected to your person. That's how it happens. Meeting somebody always happens through some sort of a happenstance, something. Oh, I ended up th at this party because so-and-so invited me and now I met my person. Yep, that was because of networking. <laughs> Everything mm -hmm. is networking. So network, network, ne network. That's number two. Ooh, and if I only get one more wish that I would want you to do, number three would be to be very clear about what you want, understand at a very core level who you are and what type of a person is going to make you a better person and help you to live your best life. And when you look for it in the world, be open to being surprised. We have our list. You need it. It's really important that we understand who we are. We understand what we want. And when we look for it and we experience it in the world, we also have to be open to being surprised because we don't always know who or what is going to be the right fit. And a lot of my clients end up, you know, oh, I didn't think of that. I, I thought I was going to marry somebody who fit into my box over here. And wow, I would have never guessed it happens to be a different country and a different background. And I always wanted somebody similar, which I love similarities, but for some people, it turns out different. So be open to being surprised in the process. Beautiful. So I'm hearing don't give up network, 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 networks. Try saying that three times. I, I tried. And, I was <laughs> too. <laughs> and be clear about what you want. So uh, I loved that last answer. Also, I have a question, a follow-up question about that. So I actually had a student that, or a client, whatever, she was 28 years old 
And she was really fed up, not, a, not an or observant or orthodox person, really fed mm -hmm. up in the dating world. She goes out with this guy and she's just totally coming off a really bad uh, breakup or whatever. And she sits him down and she's like, all right, I'm 28. I'm really not looking to mess around. She's like, if you don't have a ring on my finger in one year's time, let's just call it quits now. The end. Like, I don't need to waste your time. They ended up getting married. <laughs> and he said to her, you know, I never really, I wasn't really thinking about getting married to anyone. But when you said that, when we started going out, I started thinking like, could this be the woman that I marry? Could this be the mother of my children? And it shifted everything for him. So she was super clear and upfront about what she wanted. But what do you think about that extreme example? Would you say that's something people should do? Maybe not on the first date, but what are your thoughts there? I think that different techniques work for different people. Mm -hmm. So that is the direct approach. And for my clients that are my direct communicators that say it like it is, that's a great approach. Not always on the first date. Unusually, you know, it can work out sometimes, but in general, that should be a later conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's also an indirect approach that sometimes people take, and that also works. But what I don't like is pretending that I'm just dating and whatever happens, it'll be okay with whatever timeline. No, you're probably yeah. not okay with whatever timeline. You probably do really have an internal timeline that works for you and that should be shared at the right point in the in the dating process. But I have seen things like that work out. That's As you were telling that, I'm smiling going, yup, yup, I've seen that before. And that's worked for the right person. Right. And what would you tell someone who, you know, maybe is experiencing a dry spell where they're not meeting anyone or no one's mentioned anyone or anything like that? If they're having a dry spell, what do you suggest to someone who is experiencing that? I love to send them on vacation. They should get a massage. They should pamper themselves and they should do anything that makes them happy. Whatever makes them smile, I don't care if it's jet skiing or gardening or hiking, just go do something that will bring a smile to your face and remind you of why you are so happy to be here on earth and remind you of what your mission and your life purpose is and bring more joy into your life. When you have more joy, joy in your life, when you are a more joyful human, it's so much easier for other people to connect with you. And you'll also have stories. Oh yeah, yeah. last week I did this, as opposed to last week I still went swiping and I found nobody. We need right. to also have life experiences that are bringing us up and bringing us a lot of joy in the world. And yeah, and it makes you... It, it makes you more attractive also when you're happy and when you're vibrant, it, it attracts people to you. So I'm curious to know if you have a story that you can share maybe of a client anonymously or something that gives us a great lesson about dating in today's society. Oh, so many stories dating into in today's society. Okay. Give me a moment. Give me a moment. Sure. <laughs> it's like a quick, like you have to pick your top favorite story. So I recently had a client who uh, we started working with and we were doing matchmaking and coaching and she was telling me, she's like, Aliza, I'm, I'm kind of like open to an Aliza pick, you know, I'm, I'm flexible and here's what I'm looking for. I'm clear about what I want, but if you have something else in mind, I'm going to be open to it. And we, you know, made our first match and she's like, yeah, okay. Okay. Not exactly like this. I like this, but not exactly that. We made a second match and, and we, you know, tweaked a little bit. We got other things that she liked, but other things that also still didn't work. And we went through this process with her, which is the real matchmaking process, which is kind of like a trial and error process of trying to get as many things as a person wants all together in one package. You know, it's like the Mr. Potato Head where, you know, you're putting all the right things in the right spot. And it took us about, I think, six tries. And the last guy that we set her up with she called me and she's like, like, poo, poo, poo. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to jinx anything. But Aliza, this is amazing. Wow. She called me, you know, called me back after, after a couple more dates. And she's like, yeah. She's like, I don't really want you to set me up with anybody else. So like, we're done, but I'll still call you for coaching, but oh, no more yeah. matches. Like this is, this is really working for me. And the thing that I love people to understand about the matchmaking process, whether you do it with yourself, by yourself or with a professional, it's always going to fail until it's the right person. You'll have growth experiences. You'll meet wonderful people, but you won't 
feel good, like, yay, it worked until it actually works. And every single dating experience ends up being a failure unless you get married, unless that's your person. Not that, look, not that the experience is a failure, but my goal of the experience, the outcome that I want, I don't ever reach. I only reach it once. So it's not mm -hmm. like I get a mini success along the way. It's either it worked or it didn't. So just don't give up on the process. It's how it's supposed to go. You're supposed to fail every time until you hit the right one. That's just normal. That's a great perspective. Uh, speaking of the word goals, as you mentioned, can we talk about the difference between goals, interest, and values when dating and helping someone figure out the difference between them and what's the most important and, and how does that help in dating and with marriage? So goals are long-term life goals. What do I want? What do you want? Interests are daily things that we're talking mm -hmm. about and, and doing together or not together potentially. And values are those beliefs, those things that are, that are deeply rooted within me that I come into a relationship already with my vision of what my beliefs are that, that may shift over time as you and I get to know each other. And as a couple develops, we want to make sure that their long-term goals are aligned so that they have the potential to grow over many years. In terms of their values or their beliefs, we, we, we know that those shift over time. So there needs to be an amount of alignment so that we know that there's potential. But based on you and me and our experiences together, I might shift some of my beliefs over time. And as long as there's a little bit of flexibility in understanding other people and growing, we don't know where we're going to land. We just know that we have two people that have a growth mindset. And that's something that's really important. And in terms of interests, we need couples to have an amount of things that they have interest in doing together. And then we also have to understand, I don't like everything that you like, and I don't want to do everything that you want to do. So for example, my husband and I took a vacation together and we went away. We stayed at a hotel for a night and in the morning, he's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, oh, I want to take a bike ride or go for a walk on the boardwalk. And, and I was like, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to go fishing. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like, I have no interest in doing that. He's like, okay, good. I'll meet you for lunch. I was like, perfect. Love you. Bye. Right? right. So we spent our, you know, nights together. We went out to dinner. We did activities. We did other things. But then part of the day we separated. We weren't like Siamese twins. We weren't connected at the hip. And that's totally fine. And it's totally normal. And with interests, some of the things we have in common and some we don't, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Great. So how do you know that the person you are dating is really a good person at their core? And what are signs people should be looking for? So I have a whole system that's called Soulmate Clarity. This is my signature program for knowing, is this my person? How do I know it's a good person for me? There's a lot of good people in the world. There's a lot of good people that I could have married, but there's very few good people for me, not just a good person, but a good person for me. So the Soulmate Clarity System evaluates qualities, which includes values, personality. We didn't talk about that at all, but personality is really important. Over our lifespan, personality changes very little. It's kind of like a turtle. It's like slow and steady. This is, I am who I am, but I am going to get somewhere and I may slightly shift, but really personality is who we are. And values, we need who I am, what I want in the world, what you value, what I value. We need those things to be aligned. The other things that we also didn't really discuss yet are fears. Everybody comes in with relationship fears. That's part of our baggage. And we have to make sure that our partner is not triggering certain fears. And if they are triggering it, it's to a manageable level. It's not a really high degree. If we're with somebody that triggers us to an extremely high degree, we're not going to be able to create a long-term, healthy, sustainable marriage. And then the last category is what I would call bothers, irritants, all those things about the other person that you're like, ooh, they like kind of make you cringe. And you're like, oh, I kind of wish they didn't do that. Or I wish they weren't like that. Everybody has stuff that they love about their partner. And then they get a, a little basket of other. It's not the stuff that you love. It's just the stuff that also comes with a relationship that is not your favorite, but 
you should be able to tolerate it. Again, it can't be something that's a deal breaker. So for me, I'm constantly evaluating and I want to know, is there any deal breaker here? Because if there's a potential deal breaker, there's no marriage. You can't get married on a, with a potential deal breaker. We have to accept who you are. We have to accept who they are. And then we can come together. If I don't fully accept you and there's still a potential deal breaker on the table and we get married, I might divorce you over that. But if I'm dating you and I accept it, we get married and then I don't like it. But I don't divorce you because today that bothered me. I stick with you because I know why I'm really in this relationship, because of all the things I value and because the way that we work together is okay and you're not super triggering to me. So it's this fine balance between who I am, what I want, how I'm, I interact with you, and also how much we do or don't trigger our partner and how healthfully, healthfully we can interact with each other. That's great. And uh, let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on a woman giving or a guy giving a woman, uh, someone giving someone else an ultimatum, for example, and I'll just tell you from the woman's perspective, yeah. they want the ring on the finger. They want to get the engagement next month. Okay. Next month. And I've seen this, you know, what are your thoughts? If the guy is dragging his feet or if the girl is dragging her feet, what do you tell someone? Do you believe that the ultimatum is effective? Right. It's a good question. Uh, probably for some people, it does help. It is not my favorite method. In mm -hmm. general, I'm a fan of what we spoke about earlier, which is be upfront, talk about expectations. And you don't have to do it on a first date, but I call it your due date, D-E-W, dating, engagement, wedding, which is really a timeline for when I meet my person or who I think might be my person. I would expect to date for two months, six months, two years, right? Until we get engaged. And then from then until the wedding, I would expect to plan a wedding for two months, six months, two years, whatever it is, and have this expected timeline. So for me, I love to prep my couples and to have that conversation beforehand so that if we're not on the same page, we can talk about how to have a couple aligned. But in terms of an ultimatum and, and saying it or doing it, I, it has to come across like this. If, if you're going to do an ultimatum and this is what you're going to do, here's my way of doing it. I love you. I care for you. I believe you love me. You care for me. We've been dating for fill in the blank, six months, two years. And I really saw myself moving towards the engagement process. I don't want to break up with you, but I also can't continue to date without us moving towards engagement. My personal timeline for that, which is within the next 30 days. That's what I'm really comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about what's going on for you. Mm -hmm. Open the discussion. And they can say any, anything other than, wow, I really hear you're very serious about this marriage thing and I'm on board. Great. You know, let's plan it. Let's let's get engaged in, in two weeks, in three weeks. Anything other than that or like, oh, I'm thinking, I don't know, I'm not sure, da, da, da. It's okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give an ultimatum. I just might say, I, you know, for me to continue with this relationship after 30 days is going to be very difficult because I'm ready for the next stage and I, I need to, I need to stop. I'm going to need to try, try elsewhere because I'm not seeing this progressing in the way that I need us, you know, to go in the timeline that really works for me. And this is very difficult, but I would, it would, got to come from the heart and soul, not from a point of like, well, either we get engaged or you're going to lose me. Yes. It's not, <laughs> it's not my style. Right. So more gentle and heartfelt versus trying to control a situation. Exactly. And be willing to walk away. Yes. It breaks people's hearts, but I've seen this. I, I spoke with a couple and she's like, yeah, it's kind of been four years and, and, or almost four years. And I told him like, that's really my max. And I had the opportunity to speak with him. I was like, you have a great woman in front of you. What is going on? And he's like, I mean, I don't know. Like I just never thought about marriage and like, I, I wasn't excited about it. So I don't know. I just, it, it, it's not really like, it's not on my priority list. I said, then you should probably let her go. I, yeah. I like broke the news to yeah. him. And he said, what? I said, well, if you don't want to marry her, you're preventing her husband from finding her. So you need to let her go. And he was like, no, I don't want to break up. I said, but you don't want a family either. And she does. You're not on the same page. How can this work? And I left it as a question. And I said, think about it. Just sit with it and, and see what kind of a 
a resolution you come to see what you can figure out in the next 30 days. Smart to leave it open-ended with a question. Uh, tell me something. I want to know a story that you have never shared before, either a client or your own story, something that you've never mentioned on a podcast, never mentioned with a client. Let's hear some juice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> if you're not comfortable, I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. 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 okay no, I, I have it. I have it. I'll tell you okay. one of the craziest stories that happened. I was on the phone with a coaching client from New York and um, he's observant. He actually has two phones. He has like his regular phone and he's like, and I have my Aliza phone. I was like, what? He's like, no, I bought a separate phone and I just buy like a special plan. He's like, I don't want anybody to know that I'm talking to a dating coach or matching. <laughs> I, said, I said, okay. So we um, used to have sessions and he didn't want to be in the house, you know, because he didn't want anybody to hear that he was talking about dating. So he used to go outside, you know, it was noisy and, and lots of uh, things would happen. And, and one night we're talking and, and we're like, we're in, we're having like a deep, meaningful conversation. You know, we'd been talking for like an hour and all of a sudden I hear yelling and screaming and there's all sorts of stuff happening. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And, and I hear him, get away from me, get away from me. You're crazy. Go away from me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I have to call the police. He's being mugged. I don't know what's happening. This is crazy. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, I, he's on an Aliza phone. I can't, you can't even track him. I don't know where he is. I don't know what's doing. I'm like, okay, I'm going to start praying. Please God, you should keep him safe. Keep him healthy. Keep him well, protect him. Like, I don't know what else to do. I'm just, I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying. Two minutes pass. You know, there's like noise and, 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 and the phone's banging around and he picks the phone up and he's like, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I, I just got mugged, but I'm okay. They didn't take my phone. They didn't take my other phone either. <laughs> Wow. He's like, I'm okay, but, but I, uh, I, I got, there's just, it was hoodlums in the street. They were just, you know, you know, bothering me, but I'm okay. I, I gotta go. Okay. And I'm like, <gasps> you know, like, I'm, wow. on the other end, I'm like, I'm breathing deeply. I'm, I'm still praying for him that he gets home safely, that everything, thank God, thank God a million times. He's fine. He wasn't hurt. They didn't even, he's like, they didn't mug me. They didn't, they didn't, I mean, they mugged me, but they didn't like steal my phone. They just were like riling me up. They didn't take money. They didn't do anything. They just came to they saw me, you know, like a, a Jewish man standing on the street. They just came to bother me. And I was, wow. I was so, I mean, yeah, I was in a panic. I was like, you know, I got off the phone. I'm like, well, I can't even charge you for that call. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't take his Aliza phone. So that's good. But uh, speaking of the Aliza phone, you know, I actually interviewed someone for an article that has been dating for 30 years. She wrote a book actually called Unmatched. Uh, it was, it's apparently making waves, but I read it. I read it. Oh, you read it. Okay. So she actually told me in the interview that she felt like, you know, years ago when she was starting out and dating, you know, nobody used a dating coach, nobody used a mentor, nobody had an objective third party helping them out. And she believed that had she used a dating mentor or a dating coach, she would be married today. So I thought that was really, really powerful. Let's finish with one final question. What do you think is the most important thing to keep in mind when dating? The most important thing is to be grounded within yourself. I cannot tell you how many times I've gotten on a call with somebody. They tell me what they want. They tell me what they need. They tell me what's important to them. And at the very end of the co phone call, like the last five minutes, they're like, I mean, well, Look, some of the things I told you, and they list them off. They're like, well, my mother wants this for me. My sister told me that. My best friend thinks I need this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, 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 stop. What? They said, no, no, no. I mean, it's also kind of what I want. I said, no, no, sorry. We get to do a redo. Book another time. I need to know what works for you. What's important to you? I need you to filter out all the noise in your head. I need you to quiet it. I don't know if you want what's similar to your family or what's different. I don't know if you like what your friends like for you or if you want something totally different. I need to know what's really important to you. What is meaningful to you and what you need? If I'm only finding what they need, this is never going to work. Once I really know what you want, what you need, now we can actually figure this out and now we can go into the world and search for it. So I would tell people, 
tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Be really <laughs> clear about who you are. Be really clear about what you, Y-O-U-U-U, -U -U -U, want and filter out all the noise in your head. If you have to make a list on paper, do it. Cross out all the things that are not really what you want. If you can't figure it out, rank them. Oh, I want this 100%. I want this 50%. Oh, my mother wants this. Oh, sorry. Eh. <laughs> Cross it out. You know, it's, it's if it's what somebody else wants for you, it's not as important to me as what you want for yourself. Yeah. I think that's really the key is ranking what's important to you, not just, as you said, all the noise uh, from everybody else. So thank you so much, Aliza. I really, really enjoyed talking to you. It was a very big honor for me. I learned so much and I'm sure that everyone listening today learned as well. These are great suggestions for people to have a better dating experience. So thank you. And Aliza, let me ask you, where can people find more about you? Where can they see you online? Give us some, some info. The best place to find me is at my website, which is marriagemindedmentor.com. And you will be able to learn all about who we are, what we do. We've got podcasts, free advice, articles on h.com, you name it. We've got it. We have matchmaking, we have coaching, and we have DIY courses and an incredible network of people to help you. Well, that's fabulous. And also, if you want to learn more about Aliza, check out the article that was written about her on aish.com, which is linked in the episode description. You can find this podcast on your favorite podcasting platform and on aish.com's YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to aish.com for more content like this. And if you like what you see, if you like what you're hearing, don't be shy. We want to hear from you. Thanks again, and I will see you next week.